All right, and we are live. I'm here with Bryce Turner from Seal Beach, California, where it's probably nice and sunny and dry as we're getting pounded here from the hurricane and, and rain. But uh, Bryce, it's, it's a pleasure to have you on. Uh, I'm really pleasure looking forward to, to this one. Thanks for having me, Pete. A um, lot to talk about to cram into the time that we have. Uh, but uh, one thing I want to make sure that we get into is, is your expertise. You're, you're outside of Givoyer, who developed, uh, Dr. Givoyer, who developed the Soman and Eldoa systems. You are the highest ranking individual in, in the world, uh, basically, uh, from what I've read. You correct me if I'm wrong. And anybody who reads, reads your bio will see that. But I want to make sure that we get into that. So can just to, for starters, can you kind of tell people what that is, what it entails, and why it's so important? Because it doesn't seem like as, as great as that system is, and I've been, I was introduced to it, uh, have taken some classes, uh, that there are not very many people around the world uh, that have gravitated to it for whatever reason. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, first of all, thanks for having me on the show and, you know, thank you for the accolades. Um, you know, I think uh, Boyer's program, you know, one thing that I think that he's very clear on at the beginning of his learning process is he's only interested in working with, I guess, who would who would be considered the top 1%. And I think if you're somebody that maybe has already considered the top uh, 1% in your portion of the industry because of your education and your experience. You know, I haven't, I haven't seen any of the top level people that I know in the industry that have been around for 30, 40 years, not take a course or not be exposed with the, some of the material that we teach or Voyer has organized and not been taken back by what it is that we cover from a perspective of, you know, fascia, fascial biomechanics and integrity model and how we scope all of that, not only into exercise, but how we really focus it in sort of the acute body and trying to work to be very specific. Um, and then if you bring in all the osteopathic and soma therapy practices, you know, people who are therapists out in the world or doctors out in the world, you know, I think that they're also, you know, quite surprised how um, vast our knowledge is about the body and what our anatomical um, knowledge is and how we understand the body to move and how it, uh, it, it, it it's this complicated system. And so, um, you know, somebody like Voyer is a pioneer. You know, I mean, it, it, it's not even that he was taught well and he's regurgitating this information. He's learned so much, so many different things. And I think like a lot of us that go out into sort of this education world and try to figure out how to work with our athletes and our patients or people who are in pain or, you know, what are the, what are the best techniques? You know, we've learned all these things and we have all these tool bags of things to sort of resource. But you look at somebody like Boyer and he's really on the developmental side. He's really looking at the body and saying, Okay, I've developed these concepts that work, and out of these concepts, how do you apply techniques to the body to increase whatever your goal is? And um, I think that that's a hard thing for most of the student population to wrap their head around, because the body isn't one thing. It's not a recipe. It's not. There's not one solution for some dysfunction of the body or trying to improve performance or mobility or whatever the, the case may be. There's, there's a way of thinking about how the body does work. And I think that that is hard for students that come to a course and kind of want to be spoon fed answers and application um, because we don't teach that. We teach concepts of how to approach the body. And you have all these tools that you get taught along the way, but the, the tools are, we'll say very specific, but non-specific to sort of the global market. You know, like if I want to work one way with somebody, that's going to be different how I'm going to work another way with somebody else. Mm -hmm. But the goal might be the same. Um, so, you know, as far as, you know, even my own path, um, you know, being, I wanted to quit early on. You know, I, I wanted to be one of those students that was just like, I took, you know, a handful of classes and I was like, I don't understand what's happening here, what he's teaching. I don't know how to apply in my practice. The anatomy is way over my head, which I always prided myself in somebody that knew anatomy really well. That was always something that I was really concentrated on, even in college and biomechanics in college and things like that. And then when I started learning his anatomy, I was just like blown up. Right. And, um, 
you know, then there, there's the obvious factors that I think most people probably have a problem with, which is there's a little bit of a language barrier. Mm -hmm. He can be relatively difficult to understand if you don't really have the mind for trying to listen or whatnot. And, you know, he's a little bit more, I'll say, whether it's a European or French approach or whether it's kind of an old school approach in education, which is he's going to make you work. He's going to make you think he's going to make you he's going to challenge the education model. How I would say probably most U.S. students uh, get taught. Or, or, or know how to learn, where we go to class, we try to memorize things, and then we try to apply what we get, what we memorize, right? Or we try to find systems through things, you know, where, okay, you want to heal a rotator cuff problem, you need to do step one through five, you know, and that's mm -hmm. going to be your rehab. And I think that our, our most of our approach to the body, whether it be fitness or whether it be rehab, tends to follow that model. And that's just not how the body works as we know, right? What, so I think what is you take it? Some complicated. Go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but it, you, I've, you, right. you have said about the now. I, I don't. The course I took, and I only took one. Um, and again, yeah. I, I'm not. I'm not educated in your field. I, I'm. I'm an amateur at best who who likes to follow and, and read up on different things. And that's how I found the check system, the voice system, the Poliquin system, right. and a lot of others. But I have also I've heard what you just said. Uh, you that, that the anatomy. Uh, education through the voice system is extremely, extremely intense and so and very advanced. I've heard Dan say it. I've heard many people who have taken the class say it. Now, when I took the class, I don't have anything to base on because I never took an, a, a, an in-depth anatomy class in college or high school or anywhere else. Uh, mine is all like, you know, lo looking at uh, uh, the Valier's of uh, the body and weight training and what muscles are used and, and different things like that. Um, but I've heard that over and over. So before Going further, can you just explain how the, the soma and the voice anatomy class is so much more advanced than, than something that someone might get in, in physical therapy school or in uh, training school or, or traditional education? Yeah. So, I'm, sure, I'm sure we could talk hours you know, the, on that, but if we could give a glimpse. Yeah. You know, I, th I think, and again, like I always had a passion for anatomy, and I can even remember going through the check system and Paul being so anatomically sound and him mm -hmm. talking about structures and how these things go like this. And I remember being in the front row of one of the conferences that he was lecturing at and he started just picking off people in the audience about anatomy. And I was like, I hope he doesn't call on me because I don't know what the hell he's <laughs> talking about. Right. And I, and like, I generally knew anatomy at that point, you know, but I didn't want to be embarrassed because I was like, Oh my God, this guy's going to stare me down and go, what is this muscle? And what does this do? You know? And you're just like, uh, I don't know. Right. But yeah, when I, I, you know, again, I think that that was part of the difficulty in the beginning stages of the, of the program where, you know, when I would take classes with him, day one was eight or nine hours of anatomy lecture. And, you know, if we were doing a lower limb strength class, he was lecturing eight or more hours on the lower limb anatomy. And it was just like, you know, the, the muscles were sort of secondary to what it was he was teaching. You know, it was just like, yeah, yeah, we got those muscles there. And you're like, yeah, but that's what I know. And he was talking about how the fascial systems really integrated with those muscles. You know, what other structures are there as far as like lymph vessels and nerves? Um, what does the bony structure look like? Why is the articular surface in this position? All of these different things. So he's talking anatomy and biomechanics sort of, you know, hand in hand. And, and he, one thing he does really well in sort of this theory or anatomy lectures <clears throat> is that he repeats things a lot. So he might have five different slides of sort of the same anatomy, but kind of gives you a chance where he'll start talking about it. And then he'll get to the next slide and he'll be like, well, what does this do again? How, did, how does this? Because he wants the the students to interact with the lecture, you know, he wants, yeah, he wants, us wants to answer to the question. It. Yeah. He wants right. you to process it's it. Like, and okay, try you've to seen it. this now, right. You've seen this five times. What is this? I'm not going to talk anymore. You guys tell me what's going on here. And so mm -hmm. then that, that forces that learning process, right? All of a sudden you have to make the answers instead of just taking notes about it or seeing a picture and going, Oh, what was that again? You're already in that phase where it's like, Hey, you need to talk about it now. And, I think that that, you know, again, the learning model that we're used to 
it, that can be embarrassing for some students. Nobody wants to be called out. Nobody wants to look stupid. Nobody wants, you know what I mean? Because if they don't know, they don't know. But I think that that's where he tries to break down all the students in some point that just says, hey, I'm teaching you this stuff. It doesn't matter whether you learn it today, but you need to start having an idea, a visual like stimulation of what this stuff is that's in our body and start understanding. If you don't remember the name right now, we don't care. At some point, we're going to care. And really, if you don't know the name, we don't care. As long as you know that there's something there and it goes from here to there, when you really have to know the name is when you're an instructor like me and I have to regurgitate those structures and that information back uh, to the students. But, you know, I think you just get so exposed to it, you know, like, and he lectures and he breaks you down. And like, you know, the first day you leave a, a, cl a class and you're just like, mentally exhausted because you've just seen so many slides of anatomy and so many different structures and so many different ways. And he said something very profound. I remember years ago in one of the classes where he was like, listen, it's not my job to teach you guys anatomy. It is my job to teach you the link in the system of the anatomy. And I thought that that was very interesting because, you know, that that's something that I carried with me even in my own instruction, which is basically I'm not trying to regurgitate what is an every anatomy book that's out there. Like you want to go learn and memorize the anatomy, go open up those books and go look at those things and try to remember the names of the muscles and all this stuff. What we're trying to teach is the concept of the anatomy based on the fascial system and saying, okay, here's these muscles, here's the fascial systems of these muscles, here's how everything's integrated. You know, the anatomy slides that we look at are completely different from anything that we're usually exposed to in normal so uh, English or U.S. you know teaching uh, textbooks or manuals or anything like that, or, or even get a, a lot a of the cadaver, or even the cadaver when when you yeah even the cadaver. the cadaver yeah. yeah right and to understand what those structures are in the body and not just cut away some of that connective tissue and throw it away and just go oh look at this beautiful uh, piece of uh, muscle. And you know Voye's uh, prescription of the muscular system is it, it's just dumb meat. Right. Like it's just <laughs> <For that>. something <laughs> that contracts and relaxes and like based on the size, the shape, the direction, all of those things that, you know, sort of are the movement of our bodies is all predicated on the fascial system. And the fascial system is our intelligence because the intelligence of the fascial system is the allowance of movement, the architecture of the muscle or the bone or where the vessel goes or what are the different layers as far as what slides and moves, you know, how these things are all interacted with each other and what is the link of the body. And that's really his main focus is understand the link. And when you understand the link, you understand the more of the complicated system that says, Hey, you've got this posture of the body. You've got this movement of the body. What else is integrated with that? Not just, Oh, I need to work on my biceps today. You know? Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, he, He's just got a ton of like application knowledge. I mean, so again, like we spend so much time with anatomy and, and me being an instructor and like really picking up on those things because I'm a visual person. Like I like looking at these things is when I started teaching, I, I don't think I realized how much of it was in my head and I didn't know how to really access it. And so one of the big rewards for me that when I instruct and I get to review this anatomy and talk about it with the students is that I'm. I get to access that information that's in my head. I get to kind of reutilize it and go, hey, you've got this structure and you got these things and this links to that. And we use something called uh, continuity and contiguity, which is going to be the direct link, which is the continuity of something. Um, and then we have something that's contiguity, which is a relational structure that's neighboring, say, another structure that might influence how it moves, but it doesn't have a direct link via the tissue or the fascial system. And so mm -hmm. we talk a lot about those concepts in the body in regards to, you know, how we move and how we train and how we do therapy and all that. And I, I think the general scope is just like a lot of exercise or even if you look at golf, you know, on, I can re like if I use the example of the first time you did a postural screen on somebody, if you saw two, three, four things, you were doing pretty good, right? You saw those things. Mm -hmm. you, you learned to see those things. And then all of a sudden you see eight things and all of a sudden you see 20 things. And all of a sudden you, as soon as somebody walks in the door, you're like, I know what's wrong with that person, right? Like you mm -hmm. start picking up different information as you go and your eye gets more in tune, your hands get more in tune. And I always call it the art of the practice. 
And it's like you need to spend time in it. Like as much as you need to learn what's in the books and in the manuals and practice exercise and, you know, practice manual therapy or anything like that, um, you you need to understand that at some point you forget about all that stuff, right? And you start reacting to the body that's in front of you, right? You start seeing things. You're like, no, don't do that. Do this. No, I don't like that. Let's put it over here. Okay, let's change yeah. that. Okay, put your head this way. Okay, arms here. Okay, legs like that. And like you're just sort of like almost molding or scope, uh, uh, sculpturing somebody in front of you to move better or trying to find some different way to activate the musculature, the tissue or the nerve or the appropriate stuff, whatever the situation is, right? There's not an exact anything that you can really describe in a picture, a video or a book. It's just you have to be living with that living person in front of you and you have to be able to find what works. And I think the people that figure out sort of that artistic way of viewing the body and how to apply exercise and movement, those are the successful people. Those are the people that are outside the normal box of, mm -hmm. you know, what it is that therapists do and trainers do. And they're really the ones getting the result because they're reacting to the person that's in front of them. And I think that those are the big things anatomically and biomechanically that we really start to pick up in the program when you spend enough time with it, that it isn't this one thing, but it definitely starts as one thing, right? Like, Here's L-DOA for L4-5. Okay, so you have an exercise, but you also have a person, and you might have a dozen people that need to do L4-5. And L4-5 is now different for each one of those people because there's an ability level, there's a pain level, there's mm -hmm. you know mobility, awareness. There's all these things that kind of compile into exactly what it is you're going to do with an exercise and what your goal is behind it. And so a lot of the new all, students... you got all the come, residual. How, how the body's going to react, yeah. where, where it's going to reset itself right. to, to use a, maybe that's a poor word, but it's very easy right now right. in my head, but how's the body going to react to that? Right. And so a lot of the new students are always asking those questions like, well, I have a client with this problem. What do I do? It's like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. It depends. <laughs> right. Like, and I kind of, I, I sound like a broken record when I say that, you know, with my students, cause it's just like, Okay, well, it depends. Is this happening? Is that happening? Have you tested this? Can they do that? What's happening with this? And they're kind of like, yeah, but what's the answer? And you're like, that's the thing is there is no answer. And I think that that's hard, again, for the students to like digest because it's a very, it's a very high level program. And, and so for the students, they can't wrap their head around that concept and approach to the body. You know, the program doesn't work for them. And so you know, that's, uh, that's where you sort of get that weaning out process. Yeah, Guy had worked on me a couple of times. And, and one of the times I was there, he, he was de describing fashion. And I, I said, I have a general understanding of it. And he said, well, where did you learn it? And I said, well, Sharon Wheeler, who's one of Ida Rolf's original 40. Right. Uh, Sharon, uh, she, she comes through this area about two to three times a year. And she had worked on me a number of times before I came down there. And we got to talking about Rolfing and and. He said that he had somebody who was in that system that had come to him with, with just a full chest of information and sheets and data and research and study on fashion. Said, I understand that this is what you're into. Would you like this information? He said, no, nah, I don't need that. Before he realized what it was. And now, and he told me, he said, if I could just go back to that point in time, I, I would have saved so many years of, of trial and error myself. Uh, right. and he, he wished that he could go back and do that. But uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, yeah, it, 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 it when working with all these systems, uh, I, I think that with the technological advancements that we have now, now we have all this data. I think for, for many years, the last 15 years or 20 years, uh, in any in most any field that deals with the body, be it sports or physical fitness or training or therapy, that we're able to compile all this information. I think finally everybody's in total agreement that what some people thought was going, this was going to be the answer because it was so-called science. If that word's been beat to death now after the last few years that right. we're realizing what we knew when we started and that everybody is different. We just have, we know where to, what alley right. to send people down at this time. And then what tangents or side streets that they might have to get off on that we can direct them, be it as a, as a physical therapist or me with somebody swing. Um, that, right. that There are so many things and, and so many tangents and so many things that they can get off on. And the more experienced somebody is, meaning the more times that they made mistakes and or got educated and learned, Usually in the in the real world environment, and not just simply, like you said, people taking a class and thinking, okay, what's the answer? It's not that simple. It's you're taking all of right. these various things that you've learned throughout your career, 
real life application saying, here's right. what I think you need. And if you, if that doesn't work and it, it it's not going to hundred percent, here's, here's what we need after that. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of, I think really great education that's out there and, you know, to, you know, in my own sort of, sort of education research and application, you know, I've been hanging my hat so much over the last, I don't know, 13, 14 years on, you know, Voyage education because it's so comprehensive and it's such a big program that it really does take time to digest all this information. And, you know, a lot of that was accomplished by taking a lot of classes and retaking classes. And then luckily I have a facility that I get to practice all the time. You know, like I get to do the manual therapy and I get to do the exercise and I have a staff and I educate my staff and they're utilizing the tools and I get to teach all the time. So I'm, I'm constantly just living this stuff. Right. And so it's hard for me to like take a step back sometimes and go, what other things are out there? You know? And so I get a lot of students that are always asking like, Hey, well, what about this education platform or that education platform? And so I'm kind of in the process right now of, of trying to get out there and, and, you know, really look at some of the sort of all, you know, the big, sort of staple education platforms right now that do deal with fascia. And there's a ton of parallels in all the education, a ton of parallels. And at every level of the edu uh, of different classes and different programs, you know, they all have what I would consider every program, including ours, has holes in it, right? Mm -hmm. And when you lay all of those practices over the top of each other, there are no holes, right? We, we, there, there's a pretty good comprehensive coverage of the body right now, like whether you're into PRI or you're, if you're into, you know, functional anatomy or you're into even if you bring in, you know, FMS and all those other different practices, you know, from an assessment standpoint, a movement standpoint and, and whatnot. Like if you have all of those tools that you've kind of put in your back pocket, you know, I can't imagine there isn't anything that you can probably solve with somebody's body. I mean, if, then, then you're talking like, you know, 0 0.0, you know, some degree or, or percentage of, of people that you probably can't do something with. Um, and I like all the different lenses. You know, I have a couple of colleagues that I teach with and I work with. And they all have different backgrounds. And when we get together and we talk and, you know, we kind of come from our different perspectives, you know, it's like at the end of the day, we could have a four hour conversation <laughs> and we arrive at the same answer. But we've all sort of like come from our own scope of practice. You know, this says this and this says that, and, you know, but what about this? And this has got to be, you know, considered. And it's, you know, it's, it's a really great educational debate, but it's, um, you know, at the end of the day, we're always trying to say the same thing, you know, and it's just sort of we're saying it from our own perspective and our own approach. But at the end of the day, it's still the body. Right. You, you know, yeah. And when you were talking about um, being able to see things, you know, you take the educational course and but Guy's whole thing was you have to I'm going to give you all this information. But it's all you're also going to have to learn how to integrate it. So we're going to repeat it and then I'm going to call on you to do it. And then you say, you know, you work going back to working your practice and then you have your staff and, and others in your facility who are working under you, being able to see what they're doing and get their feedback. And, and I mean, it just gives you a, a deeper understanding of it. And I always go back to I've had debates on this with other golf coaches because Sports Illustrated and you being involved in baseball. Uh, out where you are quite a bit. Uh, you might remember this. I, I think it was about 15 or 20 years ago. There's a lengthy article in Sports Illustrated, about 15, 20 pages. And the title of it was, are good hitters born or are they, is it a, a developed skill? And after all the research and the data that they had, they, they said that the best hitters and they had the uh, Howards and they had uh, Ichiro and they had, you know, uh, uh, what's his name that, that was in Seattle and then the Yankees, uh, A-Rod. I mean, they had all the, uh, Pete Rose, they had all these guys on there that they had researched. And it turned out that it was motion recognition because as they could recognize the movement of the pitcher, they could start eliminating parts of the plate. And this is happening in microseconds based on the right. way that he, they lift the pitcher, lifted their leg or moved their shoulder, their arm. They knew that they could eliminate a section of the plate so that the, the area that they were swinging to based off of that assumption and that movement that was processed in their brain, the best hitters were swinging to a portion of the plate that was, let's say, eight inches cube instead of the mm -hmm. entire plate, which is, I, I can't remember how big a home plate is, 16 inch. We'll, yeah. we'll call it a cube for sake of not having a 
designated yep. side. You're right. it, it, w- w- yeah, when you're swinging at a, at a baseball coming at you 90 plus miles an hour and, and one person swinging to a six inch area and one person swinging to a 16 inch area, that's a major, major difference. Right. And, and that was the gist of the article was that they have watched this motion enough uh, right. that they know where to look. And the, the right. same can be true for a therapist or a trainer or swing golf coach like myself, hitting coach, uh, martial right. arts, you, you name it. You can apply it to anything that deals with human movement. When you start to read people, you know, like you start to pick up on little subtleties and nuances and things like that. Like, you know, in the assessment time, it's it's funny and, it, and it's, you know, whether it's intuition or, you know, you're reading body language or you're listening to words or you're reading between the lines when you're having a discussion with somebody. You know, there's whenever I'm assessing somebody, it's like I always figure out where I need to go based on how the conversation goes or what my assessment goes. It's like, you know, again, another concept that we teach in the program is kind of never believe what you see unless you can test it. You know, like if you if you see something, you're like, okay, I see this. Is that what it is that I think? And what whether their assessments movement wise or awareness wise or proprioceptive wise or palpation wise or whatever do I need to do? And until I can kind of crowdsource some of that information, you know, that's when I have to start believing it. But you never want to just believe one thing and go, oh, that's it, right? And mm-hmm. or tell start telling yourself a story in the assessment process with somebody that, oh, well, you have back pain on the right. Okay, well, it must be the right side of your back. Right. Like that's that's it's never the ne- case. Never where right? the, yeah, it's usually never where the pain right. Uh, it's like okay, that's stuff. where that's where the result is, but where is this coming from, and how how is it being driven? You know, and so there's there's a lengthy conversation behind all those things. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that if you look at baseball again, you know, I, I spent some time with the Dodgers, um, and I have to be honest. I mean, I've spent my most of my time with the Dodgers when I look at teams. But really understanding how they're integrating movement in their program is pretty amazing. I mean, they are fully integrated from the field coaches to the in-facility therapists and coaches, and everybody's talking to each other, and everybody's integrated together, and everybody's bought into what systems it is that they're using, Mm -hmm. and they're constantly evaluating those movements and practice and well, it would really be nice if we can change this and get this a little bit more like that. And everybody's on the same page instead of everybody kind of being in separate categories and then going, oh, that's bothering you? Go see the therapist. I don't know what you need to do, you know. And and so when you have a very integrated system like that for each athlete that surrounds every athlete to try to get the best performance out of them and keep them healthy, you have a winning team, you know, and mm-hmm. you have a successful team and you have a healthy team and you have a culture that prescribes to that. And I think that that's been, you know, most impressive is, you know, how much education that they brought in the door and how they all integrate together and they they live on these systems, you know, for each each movement practice. And, um, you know, I, I really haven't seen it replicated that well in other teams and sports. So that's is, been pretty impressive. As someone who, who has been around a long time and you, you've studied a lot of different systems, you've worked with professional athletes at all levels and, and you had as you say, you work with the Dodgers and there's a very cl- close correlation between batting and, and the golf swing. I'm sure someone out there in social media land is going to c- tell me I'm wrong and probably cite some paper that says it's not, but it is. <laughs> I've done enough study on it. Um, right. Do, do you see that um, training in general has gotten too linear in today's world where it's it's a push or it's a pull? And not yeah. enough rotation focused or it, it, let, let you integrated focus on the entire system and the, and the, the movement of the body. Yeah, I mean, if you break down, you know, you have sagittal plane, frontal plane, and then we say the transverse plane, right? Those are sort mm-hmm. of the three basic movement programs. Um, yeah, I mean, the argument in all sports is how much time do you have? How much output can you put an athlete through, Right. When you're in season, that's going to be different than when they're off season. And then there's going to be things that you need to test, which is within the deficits of what it is that they're lacking in their movement protocols. Or do they have pain and dysfunction or, you know, where where you see that you need to create opportunity um, for their performance. So it's, you know, 
I think the tradition, the traditional practice has always sort of been this bigger, stronger, faster, right? Like run fast this way, you know, reinforce your entire body potentially to the point where you don't move very well. Um, <laughs> and yeah, like, you know, whether it's lateral movement, whether it's transverse and rotational movement, I think really where it's going is understanding how the body is loading itself in these different sling uh, positions, right? So mm -hmm. whether it's a golfer, whether it's somebody who throws, whether it's a baseball player swinging, whether it's a receiver going up and catching the ball or knocking the ball away or a volleyball player coming up and loading to, before they hit, you know, it's, it's, it's understanding this from head to toe to the fingertips sort of integrated power movement where the fascia plays a huge significant role in, you know, creating load through the whole connective system, but also having the muscular system behind it to help support it and having the joints stable enough to, you know, go through these range of motions at a frequency that they don't break the joint down. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that that's where a lot of these looks are going to is, is, you know, this cross patterning slash rotation, you know, elongated loaded position through the, through the system of the body. Um, and not just looking at the muscle systems as that, because I think that that's where they've all sort of like lived in the, in the past is, Oh, we've got this muscle and this muscle and this muscle. And you know, we need to train those muscles. Yes. But you need to do things that are integrated so that those slings are, operating right we're, we're challenging mm -hmm. the the load and the recoil mechanism of that fascial system because that's where all the power speed and um, resistance comes from right without and, and and that's where you see the breakdown of any athlete and they get the injuries is that sling system or that connective tissue system can't manage the force that's being put through it whether it's because of range of motion whether it's because of speed or whether it's because of load and so if the body can't manage those movements or those systems, you, like the focus is fascial exercise. That's kind of what I'm getting at. You know, like mm -hmm. don't stop training the muscles and start training the fascia, right? But no one really knows how to do that unless you're in these education platforms that say, hey, I've got to take in consideration what the fascia is doing. I need to take in consideration that there's a direction, there's a force, there's a load. And if I do exercises that challenge that, I'm going to have a better muscle. I'm going to have a better nerve. I'm going to have a better uh, fascial system. I'm going to have a better joint. I'm going to have all these things kind of integrated instead of just going, oh, train the muscle because that's what's moving, right? The, the, so the I, first I, I time think I, that I, there's been a huge shift in that sort of paradigm of thinking in regards to training any athlete. The the, the first introduction I've seen in the mainstream on that, on that was the, uh, the knees over toes guy where, where he's working on the knees. Now he's doing okay. it in somewhat of a linear fashion to where he's walking backwards on the treadmill is the big one. And he's working full range of motion on his, uh, splits on his full range, uh, split squat. But at least I, I, I see that he's focusing right. on an area that, that gets damaged because the quads, the hamstrings, the, the, the glutes, everything else becomes so strong and out over, overloads and over forces the knee joint it, for, for people who are running, you know, football baseball or cutting and soccer and things like that you know you could you could say the same uh, i would say for the shoulder joint in, in golf which is a, that seems to be a big problem obviously lumbar i think left elbow or left wrist was second but the lead the lead shoulder was one of the things that takes the brunt of the force uh, as far as injuries it's in the top four for golfers that not I, that, that that's just saying that the industry as a whole is at least starting to shift towards hey we can't just build these strong muscles bench press squat on the glutes hamstrings right. so we, we've got to develop the whole system that it, it can accommodate and especially in, in golf because i mean and, and dan has a theory that the year-long schedule and i think they're starting to, to cut it back now but the, the lighter shafts the fat the speeds that these guys are and the girls are starting to swing at um is going to cause more and more injury now th there's a debate for that and that okay you're talking about high high level athlete that's doing this repetitive stuff every day they're doing it from one direction there's limited structural balance but my my question to you is someone who is has worked with baseball players you work with golfers you you've seen it you have a very 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 wide knowledge base is and and we talked before baseball from day one was focused on speed and strength I mean, the, the, those guys were for a very long time have been 
folk, the, the stronger and the more flexible and mobility you can have, the, the harder you can hit the ball, the longer it's going to go, you hit more home runs. Golf has really kind of come to that for you with the development of Bryson. So is there something that golfers should be doing that baseball players have, or is it just that the, the, the differences between, let's say, a wooden bat at the major league level versus a graphite shaft in, in the PGA Tour level, it's not going to allow that. They're just going to continue to swing beyond what the body can do, no matter how many weights or how much they stretch or develop the fascial system. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's kind of two things that initially pop into my mind, which is, number one, you know, a baseball player has got a full staff around him, right? Because he's got mm -hmm. a team, and that team manages the players. When you're a golfer, you got you. And unless you put those pieces in place, you don't have a full staff necessarily functioning with you. Like, a, if you're a successful golfer, you have your people, right? Um, but I think that that's a little bit different than – having a fully functional staff of, you know, therapists and trainers and doctors and things like that, that like a team would have. Um, so you have, you know, this sort of integrated approach that a lot of times these people are constantly measuring and evaluating and looking and, you know, working on the, on their bodies to be the best. I think the other side is the culture of golf until Tiger came along really had nothing to do with fitness, mm -hmm. right? It was, you're told not to do it. You didn't want to bulk up. Right. It, it, it was always sort of this concept of you played, you know, golf was always sort of a leisure sport, even though there was high performance going through it. You know, I think when you look at what what Paul Check even identified, you know, through his golf program, you take a drive and that's 90 percent of your one rep max, you know, which is a lot of output for your body. Um, you know, and then when Tiger Woods came along and somebody identified him uh, in his younger years as being very hypermobile. Mm -hmm. And they were basically saying like, hey, it's great that you can rotate all the way around your body and create all this club head speed and whip around and, and strike the ball. And but your body's never going to maintain that. Right. So we need to reinforce around your joints and uh, around your body so that, you know, all this sheer force that's going through your joints and rotation and flexion, extension and all that are going to be able to maintain themselves over a period of time. And clearly he's still had sort of his own life of injuries with his knee problems and his back problems and different things like that, um, that he's had to deal with. And, you know, I, I think I'm working with somebody right now who that's very interesting because he very much has that young Tiger Woods body. You know, he's lanky, he's thin, he's very hypermobile. Um, he's making his way up through his collegiate years of playing right now. He's mm -hmm. come off. I originally started seeing him because he had, one labral tear on one side, he potentially mm. has now a second one on another side, um, but he just moves so much, right? And he doesn't have a lot of muscle mass to him, but the argument has been, so he has his college coaches looking at him and going, hey, we need to bulk you up and put muscle on you. And I'm like, no, like, it's not that he doesn't need to reinforce and strengthen, but like they're doing it in a way like they would be training a football player. Right. It's like he's not a football player. He's a golfer, right? He's a small guy. He's an ectomorph. He's hypermobile. Like, stop trying to get him to bench 300 pounds. Stop trying to get him to do, you know, hang cleans and, you know, all these, like, <laughs> Olympic dynamic movements. Like, he's already putting all that stress through his body. He doesn't need to prepare for some sort of high-load contact with another player. He needs to be able to maintain his mechanics through his swing so he doesn't kill his body, Right. He doesn't kill his spine. He doesn't kill his shoulders. He doesn't kill his knees or whatever may happen. And, you know, he was an athlete as a young kid growing up playing baseball and football and had his own level of injuries playing those sports and things like that until he settled on golf. But, um, you know, his focus is that he wants to get to the next level. So I've had to tell his college trainers back off. Right. Like, let's train to his body type. Like he can go out on the golf course tomorrow and hit it 300 to 325 yards, and he weighs like 160 pounds, right? The guy, the guy's whipping the club around, and he's got a, a tremendous amount of speed and force, right? And he's also, and he's, he's very good at his control, and he's a sniper on the golf course and things like that. So, what does he really need to improve? Nothing. We just need to make sure that golf doesn't break him down, so that he can continue playing. Till he's 40, 50 years old and make whatever money he's going to make, hopefully, in, in, in the PGA Tour. But, um, you know, it, it's it's controlling the idea of what needs to be the performance goal for each athlete. 
And somebody like golf has a different perspective of what it is that they need to accomplish on the golf course based on volume of strokes, based on positioning that they need to maintain, based on rotational capacity, force, speed generation, and all those things that they're going to have when they are constantly performing, especially in a four-day tournament, right? Um, so outside of that, you look back at the baseball players, and like, honestly, like baseball players, their goal is they're standing there, and then they need to be 100% right? Like rarely are you standing there and don't really need to do anything, right? So if you're an outfielder and nobody hits you the ball the entire game, except for the ninth, the bottom of the ninth, somebody hits a fly ball in the gap and you go from standing around for nine innings and taking off into a full sprint to go catch the ball, right? So the demands on the body are always going to be different, right? Or they've been standing in the outfield all nine innings. They've only had maybe two or three at bats. And they're going up there and they're swinging at full capacity. You know, it, it's one thing like as a golfer, you're constantly swinging through a, a round. Yeah, baseball players swinging time. every two to three innings, depending on how the game goes. Right. And so even though they do their warm ups and they move around and they're, you know, they do their warm up throws and they're and they're constantly trying to move their body. Baseball, that's the difficulty of baseball is the standing around. Right. And not moving constantly in a way that your body is essentially ready for that 100% output when you need it. And, you know, people want to hit the big home runs and they've changed how the swing path is so that the bat head is in the 16 inches and, you know, can address the ball. And it's not just a snap through the zone kind of me mm -hmm. uh, mechanic now. And, um, you know, the big, uh, the big thing is always, you know, again, going to be shoulder problems and elbow problems from all the guys that throw. Rarely do you have swinging injuries. Rarely do you have swinging injuries. Unless yeah, it's I, just I, that like, was one of the questions I had for you. And I, I know yeah. that they're, they're taking batting practice. And I don't know how many times they hit balls they hit in batting practice, but I mean, they're hitting a fair amount, enough that you would think that there would be some sort of lumbar issue in baseball, but there's right. not. And I find that amazing. Well, I think, you know, you're in more of an upright posture when you swing. A baseball bat, you know, you have more of this level contact with your spine, more vertical, mm -hmm. whereas golfing, you start in a bent over position, you stay in that bent over position until you finish. Um, so I think that that probably has a lot to do with it. You know, whether it's a matter of baseball tends to finish back and golf tends to finish forward. I don't know. You know, you're swinging something that's technically heavier in baseball than you are in golf, but it depends on speed and force and all that stuff and how you measure the, that stuff through the soft tissue of the body. Um, I would argue that the volume is higher in golf, but yeah. I, to be honest with you, I, I don't know the answer of how many balls any of the batters hit in a batting practice. Like they usually go through several rounds of maybe 20 pitches, I think, at a time. I can't imagine, a, you know, going through a batting practice and they're doing 150 swings like a golfer would, right? Um, you, you see the home run derby. Those guys are going out there and they're swinging hard, but the guys that <laughs> yeah. volume up on the home runs, they've hit 25, 30 home runs. Their performance goes like this real yep. quick. You know, they get so fatigued in that batter's box trying to hit them out. And it's like, effectively, that's what golfers do. You know, like even if you take 70 swings in a round, you know, and, you know, uh, whatever, eight, maybe 18 of them are drives or full level swings. Like even if you're on an, a fairway drive or you're, you're hacking away with a, you know, a, a wedge or anything like that. Or if you play golf, like I do, then there's 120 drives or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it, it, it's always coming down to demand and, you know, fitness has definitely grown into golf and you're seeing huge uh, performances of, uh, of that. But, you know, I, I would I would be interested to really compare the statistics and how the performance of golf is today and how it was like I can we can always say that, yeah, they're driving it farther and all this different stuff. But there's such technological advances in the equipment that allows for things like that to happen. But the numbers really haven't changed. Right. So that was one right. thing that Czech always talked about is like, hey, you have 100 years of golf and you have these statistics of how players played. And the numbers really haven't changed too much within a couple strokes. Maybe it's not like all of a sudden they're hitting fifties, 
you know, in a in an eighteen hole round. No, that, that, I've had Lou Stagneron. Lou has uh, he advises. He's a statistician. He he advises Arcos, which is a measuring system. They you put devices in the butt end of your club, and they, they can track right. you know what you swung and where you hit it. I think he's got seven hundred million data swings or wow. in rounds within that system. And uh, so some of the argument back is because they're hitting it. The players are hitting it longer, and the ball doesn't curve as much. Is the, the greens are faster speed. They're they're able because the, the setup of the course is adjusted, so they're at the highest of levels. They're cutting pins closer to edges than they ever have before. You know, it used to yeah. be. I mean, I, I was playing back in two thousand to two thousand and seven, and it used to be they they would not cut a pin closer than three to four feet from the edge. I, I think that's probably gone closer to three feet now. Uh, right. j- just because they, they, I mean, how else are you going to defend a golf course? So th- there have been things to counteract the equipment, but I think the, the equipment in golf has, has not only allowed, but, but uh, push golfers at that level to swing harder. Because when you and I were younger, the, the, the lot of balls that spun a lot, if you hit them very hard, uh, they were just going to spin more. You were actually not going to hit as long. Nowadays, the harder you hit it, the longer it's going to go, just period. And shafts nowadays are right. 60 grams or even they're getting down in the 50s. Right. And it's, so it's, right. it's, it's pushing you in the direction or the, the players to swing harder. Where in the older days, harder you swung, it, it didn't equate to more distance or more accurate. Probably got less right. accurate the harder you swung. Where, where baseball, I think at the right. major league level, you got the wooden bats and doesn't matter what they do, it, it, it's, it is what it is. And it hasn't changed in... Yeah, since hasn't the beginning. changed in 120 years, except for maybe the weight of the bat. <laughs> you know, like where Babe Ruth was using a 46 ounce bat or something like that, which was just <laughs> a log. You know, and now they're more like 30 ounces or 32 ounces or something in there, depending on the size of the bat. Um, so, do, do you still think, as far as across the spectrum, that doing a proper squat would be the king of exercises? I think it's probably one of our more functional exercises because it just integrates so many of the joints, Um, you know, and depending on how you load the squat, I mean, you know, anytime I get somebody in our, my facility as part of their assessment is, you know, we're looking at the squat as far as how they move, but our big carryover and the repetition of the movement has more to do with the awareness of how they're moving through that range of motion and then trying to figure out what are the demands that they need. So it's, it's a incredibly great integrative exercise that has a lot of carryover as far as performance uh, because you're stimulating you know so many of the joints in the body but most importantly you're working with the spine at the same time and I think that that gets lost in the coaching mechanism is what should exactly the spine be doing Um, a lot of people are really focused on what are the you know the shin angle and the knee angle and the thigh position and things like that and all that's important but um, you know I think uh, kind of taking a different perspective on it is, you know, we, we're, we're totally supportive of the knees going forward towards the toes or, you know, depending on the range of motion, but it's usually at the end of the day, the shin angle and then the spine angle should match each other in some sort of parallel mm-hmm. box. Right. And, um, one of the first things that we always teach is knees do go forward before the, before you try to, you know, lower yourself. So the knees are moving forward, the hips go down, And then we try to facilitate a very organized spine through range of motion. And then load always changes that some degree because of stability and things like that that you need to uh, inquire about the spine. Um, But, yeah, I mean, squats are always going to be one of those dominant movement exercises that every athlete should do, you know, in variation of all the different positions that they may need to do depending on the demand of their sport. Yeah, I still struggle with that bad. I, I have about zero dorsiflexion in my ankles. I mean, I'm lucky to get it to 90 degrees. And uh, Guy, Guy adjusted yeah. my my, uh, the, my my leg bone oh, as it came into my ankle, yeah, the talus, and, and it was a world of difference. But, I mean, that, that was, I don't know, that was years before COVID. But I still stretch that thing yeah. every, um, three, four times a week. And I'm, I'm better than I was. But, I mean, if I, if I get a slant board, I can do a squat where my shins and spine are parallel, and I'm, I'm pretty good. But... For me to get my keep right. my heels on the ground, that might not ever happen <laughs> in my lifetime. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> but I still try to utilize. Yeah, it. it's, it's pretty. It, it's pretty interesting, you know. And some of this ha- is a cultural question, you know, as far as like what the squat is needed for, and some of it is. It's almost congenital, you know, like how well you can move through a range of motion like that. Like I think part of it is is definitely taught, but. 
you know, there's definitely some people depending on their limb lengths and, you know, um, sort of percentages in regards to how, what, how long the shin bone is and the femur and the femur bone and, you know, angle of the hip and organization of the pelvis and stuff like that. And soft tissue is always going to play a role in it. But, you know, I, I can remember like my kids, um, my one son, my, my third kid, my youngest one, he, his favorite position was just to get into a squat position. Like we would be standing somewhere and he'd get tired of standing. He'd be like, can I just squat? And you're just like, yeah, go for it. And he'd just, you know, ask the graphs, just sit down, perfect spine, just knees out to the side and just kind of sit there and just be as content as possible being in that position. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting when I see people come into the gym where, I assume they might, or they are going to have a bad squat and that it's really good, or they think that they're going to have a good squat and it's terrible, you know, and mm -hmm. it's, it's trying to negotiate where that position is in their body. But I mean, yeah, you're going to get, you know, just like FMS uses the squat as an assessment. You get a ton of information out of how somebody moves through range of motion. I think there's a huge carryover in the awareness and the proprioception of the body of how somebody moves and, you know, fundamentally for function and output, you can load the squat in a very functional way that's safe for the body and get a lot of output for performance as well. Yeah, I, so. I'm just a stubborn SOB that I keep stretching and doing stuff that I, I'm so determined to one day just do a full range of motion squat and I, that'll be like reaching the peak of Mount Everest for me. It doesn't have to be loaded, it just can be body. Yeah. And uh, then I can send yeah. a video to Dan and say, see, I told you I could do it. <laughs> <laughs> Is there you just anything have to keep progression it, through your heel lift? Yes. Is, is there anything that that you see within your industry that that just makes you roll your eyes and say, "What what the hell are they thinking?" Um, to be honest with you, I'm kind of doing less of that these days. I mean, I think initially when I was, you know, learning at the level that I've been learning at and even instructing early on, you know, you kind of get stuck in this, Hey, this is the way. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing that starts to happen real quickly is you start to realize that there's a lot of ways, right. And there's something that you're constantly negotiating, which is sort of in the purity of what it is that we do, let's say from an osteopathic therapy or exercise view, you want everything to be pure and you want everything to be in this way because we know that if we do it this way, we're going to get a good result, right? But you also have a human being that you're trying to work with and there's time and there's money and there's focus and there's all these things that you're trying to tread through when you're trying to work with somebody. And, you know, like for instance, foam rolling was always such a thing not to do in our program, things that were mm -hmm. like foam rolling, fascial blasters, all these sort of self modality type things. And I used to really shake my head at it. Like I was just repulsed. Oh my God, I can't believe you're doing that. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but it's like, there's a, there's a strategy behind it, right? There's something that could be said about doing some of those things. Now, if you're going to be a total idiot and get like a hundred pound, you know, steamroller, foam roller, whatever you want to call it, that you just fucking pound your body with and roll yourself out like you're a piece of dough. That, that doesn't make any sense. Mm -mm. But um, if you're, you know, you've got a real foam roller and you get taught how to use something like that and that helps you with your body feel better, even at the minor instance that you're just using it for your calves or you're using it for your hamstrings, you're using it for your glutes. Like the whole premise behind it was to give somebody a cheap way to do some tissue work that they couldn't afford to pay somebody to do, right? And so if they have a, a better intelligence about how to use a tool like that and they just don't beat up their body, then like I think that you can get a good result with it. And somebody can do that on their own and it makes them feel good and then you move on and you try to implement other things to try to support what it is that you're trying to accomplish by treating that tissue. So, you know, like I don't shake my head at those things anymore. I just try to make sure that they're doing it based on how I would want them to do it um, rather than, you know, going, Hey, I'm just going to agitate all this tissue or I'm going to compress, you know, the tissue and the nerve and the vessel and the lymph and all that stuff and, and potentially give myself more of a problem, even though I may not show up today. 
you know, so that there's there's a better uh, idea of how to how to self treat, I guess. Yeah, and I think that's an, probably where the focus is. Would an example of that be, for example, if you're going to roll out your thighs, you know, you've been mm -hmm. working, you'd say you've been doing squats, you've been leg extension, whatever you're doing, and your, and your legs are really sore, you're tight. Would it be that, that you start from the knee and you work the roller up towards the hip because that's you don't want to interrupt the, the valves and, the, and push blood out in a direction that's not supposed to go? Would that be a that, – that, that's what I was taught or told. Uh, if you're going to yeah, do, it, so do it this way, not the other way. Right. So if you're, let's say you're on your IT band, right? Because a lot of people mm -hmm. like to do it on their IT band. So your IT band has two directions of fibers, but everybody treats it like it just has the longitudinal fibers, right? So it has the longitudinal fibers that go from the hip to the knee uh, via the glute fascia, but it also intermixes with the femoralis fascia, which is transverse around the thigh, right? So you've got this weaving system that's going yep. back and forth. Well, if all you're doing is treating one direction and you're not treating this direction, you're not really solving the problem. You might get some basic release. Um, if you're talking about managing movement of fluid and swelling, yeah, you want to work up towards the heart. So you'd, you'd possibly be working in one direction, like you're trying to push the fluid up towards that direction, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you want to take the concept of even like pinning and scraping the tissue, like you find a trigger point, you lay on top of it, and then I move my lower limb like I'm going through knee flexion and extension, and that's creating sort of that slide mechanism in that pinned area, which can also have some benefits. So you're not steamrolling the entire tissue. You're getting sort of this, <laughs> you know, movement through that tissue at a particular level. But, you know, it's like if you take the approach that you work with some of the longitudinal fibers and the transverse fibers, um, that's a better solution you know, as far as like trying to mobilize that tissue. Mm -hmm. um, but is it pure? Is it traditional? Is there a better way to treat that fascia? Of course. But now you got to pay somebody to do it or you got to be, you know, functional enough. You got to have the time. You, can, you got to have the time. Like if I'm going to do fascial normalization on somebody's IT band, <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not a bang, bang thing. Like it's, it's something that takes time and then you're paying me to do it or you have to try to do it to yourself or you got to find some other way to like try to stretch and move that tissue. Um, whereas, you know, working with a foam roller, maybe that, that gives them the, the result that they need. Not perfect, but it's, it's, you know, what will that person do? Right. Mm -hmm. What do they have the time to do? What do they have the finances to do? And you're having to kind of tread through some of those negotiations sometime. Just like when I write somebody a program, if I give them 15 exercises, they better have the time to do 15 exercises. Otherwise, they just don't do anything, right? It's People are very all or nothing kind of thing. It's like, and, you know, when somebody comes in to see me, I'm like, okay, I'm going to give you these two exercises. When I know that you're doing these two exercises, I'll give you more, you know, instead of writing some big-ass program for somebody. And then it just sits there, and I'm like, oh, how are the exercises going? Oh, great. My favorite thing is to, like, know that somebody's lying and then say, okay, let's go do the, your exercises. Let me test you on them. And they're like, oh, shoot, I haven't done any of them, you know? <laughs> or so. It's the same level that they don't, they, you know, they haven't, six, eight weeks later, they haven't advanced. Like you, right, you're at the same advanced. level you were when you came. <laughs> right, right, right. It is what, uh, as you look back at your career, thir three decades, uh, roughly, uh, longer, because yeah. I'm sure you, you got into this, you weren't, you weren't in the I started, profession. I started in the late to... late nineties. I mean, as yeah. an athlete, like you know, I mean, I was all through high school, mm -hmm. so into the late nineties, and then now. So, as you look back at that, if you could go back and, and talk to yourself, if you could sit down across from yourself and tell the the, the Bryce from nineteen ninety four, say, hey, here's one piece of advice that I that that's really going to help you. What would that be? A long conversation. <laughs> Um, I, you know, like if you're, if you're talking, you know, in our world of fitness and obviously like performance and how to take care of my body and all that stuff, I think I was lucky on one end because my mom always pushed me to be healthy and we always ate healthy and I always drank water and I always move my body and, you know, try to be relatively holistic and things like that about, you know, how I treated my body. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think that I was, I was blessed with, you know, I was relatively good at sports. 
I could pretty much pick up anything that I engaged myself with in regards to how I moved. I kept really healthy during that time. Um, I really never had any injuries except for just getting kind of banged up from time to time. And I think aside from that, it was, I think what would have been the conversation would have been more of, you know, how do I take myself to the next level? Because we didn't have those opportunities then, you know, like it was either you were self-motivated or you had a coach that was overbearing and said, mm -hmm. if you don't do this, you're not going to get to the next level because they saw that one degree of potential in you above everybody else. You know, and I think if I look back in my sports career, I didn't really have anybody barking at me going, hey, go play, you know, that next level of sports or, hey, you can be the best on the team. Or if you just trained and you just practiced, it was like you showed up, you played sports, you did good, you didn't do good, you went home. Right. Yeah. And exactly. the off the off season was I didn't play that sport. Right. Now it's like I have, you know, I have a 13 year old. I have an 11 year old. Her birthday's today. Um. And I have a seven-year-old and me being the person that I am now and understanding what it takes for some of these kids to do what it is they need to do is, I mean, these kids have the world of youth sports and all of that is outrageous right now. It's like the it's, amount it's, of money like, and time yeah. going into it is just like, holy mackerel, this is nothing that we ever had. You know, no, like, it's almost on par with um, what Division One sports was back in the '80s and '90s. I mean, it, it's that. A hundred percent. It's it's so detailed, and there's so much resources going into it. I mean, we started doing a youth training program here, which my kids take a part of. Like, I did, I I got a weight set when I was in seventh grade, right? Like, my parents were like, "Oh, do you want to have a weight set?" Sure. And I worked out on my own from time to time, but nothing too serious. But like that was light years ahead of anybody else that was around me <laughs> as far as working out went, you know, and, um, you know, now my kids have a trainer and they have a sports performance class that's focusing on movement and agility and body awareness. And they go to their, you know, private coach and learn how to pitch better and know how to, you know, all this stuff. Right. And I'm just like, all I did was show up and I pitched and I showed up and I hit and I showed up and I played football and I showed up and I did all these things. And, uh, so, I mean, I, I think like if I was to go back, like, I, I, you know, you just don't take advantage of what you don't know, right? Yeah. Like I didn't know that I was going to need to take myself to that next level. And I think when I got to my senior year in high school, I had kind of made my, my mind up. I was like, yeah, after high school, I'm done playing sports and I'm going to go to school and graduate college and then go enter the working world of life and, you know, move on with things. And this chapter of my life is kind of over. And then I got to college and I ended up uh, playing some sports and I was like, really, you, this is what you guys are doing? Like you made the team, <laughs> you know, like, how did you make the team? You know, like <laughs> I, I just didn't, under, you know, I grew up in Long Beach. This is the D1 area, you know, like all the mm -hmm. high schools around here are D1, the level of, of talent in, in California, because it's a year round sports community is, is high. And I didn't really realize that even then. And so even me being not the best player on the team, but being towards the top as far as how I performed, I didn't know. And so I think that if there's somebody out there that's competing, don't give up, you know, like ride it, ride it till you can't. I mean, you know, go out there and, and play hard and try and try to be the best you can in, in whatever your sport or your discipline is and take care of your bodies. Because I think that's, again, I was lucky I took care of myself because I had a mom that was you know, fueling those thoughts with my, with my, uh, my daily routine. You know, like I said, we ate healthy all the time and I, I didn't drink, I didn't even drink soft drinks. I didn't eat candy. I didn't eat cook. I didn't like mm. any like sweets. Like we, we rarely had fast food, which in those days, fast food was a very yeah. regular thing yeah, to it do. Was growing. Like, hey, yeah, what do you want to do for dinner now. tonight? Yeah, that was the, you know, and, and so it was, you know, let's go to get McDonald's tonight. And then the whole family goes, you know, and it was just like a thing you did, you know, and like, we just rarely did any of those things. And, um, you know, that, it, yeah, just, that was my sort of my life and my focus. And my kids have adopted that now. My kids don't, aren't interested in any of those things, luckily. Um, and so, I mean, all that does is just show that we've kind of taken the approach to teach them what is right and not right. And I think most importantly, they've learned about their own bodies that 
hey, when I do eat that stuff, I don't feel good. And I don't mm-hmm. want to feel bad, you know? And so we just don't have that culture in our house. And they see their friends go and trash themselves with food and how kids act out. And there's all these other sort of things that go on with kids these days that they're just like, yeah, I don't want to be like that. Or I don't want to hang out with that person because they are like that, you know? And it's, so it's, it's, I'm glad that they're mentally strong as far as those things go. And that's interesting. I, I had uh, Scott McNeely on. He, uh, he mm-hmm. came, his episode came out this week and he, he Maverick's dad is who he's most known for now. Maverick who's playing on the tour. He's got an injury right now, but he's out, but he was CEO of Sun Microsystems, obviously very successful, but he said yep. he, he, the, the kids were not allowed to do sleepovers because if he didn't know the parents, he didn't know what went on that house. Uh, right. They had to go to bed at a certain time. They weren't, they had to, sports was a dessert. They had to get their homework done. They had to get all A's and sports was the reward for doing that. Uh, yep. And obviously that's been, laying that foundation was very, very successful for them. If they, the, the, the one I found hilarious was if they didn't eat dinner because they didn't like the food, then yeah. they said, okay, go to bed. You don't eat. But tomorrow morning, guess what your breakfast is going to be? Only it's going to be cold. Right. So right. It, it, yeah, they, they, I mean, there is a lot. That's how my that. house is, man. Yeah. That's how my house is. Like, it's like, there's so many of our friends, like the kids are super picky eaters. And I'm like, yeah, that wouldn't roll in my house. Like this mm-hmm. is the food we're, we're, you don't want to eat it. It's going to be on your plate tomorrow. Like you guys need to eat these things. This is what's healthy. And I think a lot of just sort of the parenting aspect of it all just kind of goes downhill because the parents just want something that's easy. Like, Oh, I don't want to argue with my kid. I don't want to, you know, deal with what they want and don't want hear them whining. Mm-hmm. So, okay, I'll give them what they want. And it's just like, yeah, you just let them win, <laughs> <laughs> you know? And you know, it's, everybody always says like, you know, the, our house is the house of kind of hard knocks, but our kids are good, man. And, and everybody always says that our kids are well behaved and they have a good head on their shoulders. And, you know, our kids know how to cook and use the stove. They know how to go to the grocery store and shop in the grocery store and get what's good. And, you know, mm-hmm. um, they know how to take care of themselves. They're, you know, That's right. you got to do they, it. They've become, they become the responsible, you know, little people. And it's like my son, even, you know, today's the first day of school out here in California for my kids. And, you know, at nine o'clock, my son was like, you know, the oldest one is like, okay, we got to go to bed. We got school tomorrow. And it's nine o'clock. I'm like <laughs> how many kids, how many kids do that? Right. Like they want to stay up late. They want to, I want to watch this. I want to eat that. And like, they're just like, okay, eight dinner. Boom, boom, boom. It's time to go to bed. Clothes are out. Wow. Lunches are made, you know, and like, they're just, they're ready for the day. And so they wake up, they've slept, they feel good. Mm-hmm. They go to school, they're, they're prepared for that part of their life. And, you know, again, because my kids, you know, I I get to be the active dad in their sports. And so being an active dad, it's like, I've coached my oldest until he was like nine. And then I kind of had to say, all right, you know, the, the expertise of how to get to that next level of coaching with some of you kids, I don't really know how, but Um, so I stayed away from that, but I was always there and I always go to the practices and I go to the games when I can. And, you know, I try to stay involved in all their sports, but it's like two of them are playing two sports right now. And the other one's playing another sports and, or another, uh, one sport. And they're just, they, they want to be healthy. They want to be, you know, they want to work hard. They do well in school. I mean, we promote all of that, right? And it's 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 sticking to your guns as parents with those kids that develop those little athletes. Um, I think my wife, um, and I'm not going to get the name of the book right because I'm terrible at, at at sourcing things, but you know, like she read a book that was like how to groom your professional athlete or something like that, right? And you know what it is that you need to do to try to kind of integrate that kid and the mentality, and it, it sort of starts now, and mm-hmm. um, you know, and I, and I thought that that was very interesting because, you know, it, it is all the way down to how they sleep and how they eat and how they know to re- have recovery time and rest time and, you know, how much output they have when they're playing sports and, you know, having them download and think about things and even like having their own journal. And then as a parent, we keep track of all their activities that they do. And, you know, there's just all this sort of like systematic and philosophy type things that you do when you're working with somebody like that, because it is scoping their mental capacity as these, you know, even if it's just being a functional human being at the end of the day. Right. Yeah, that's exactly. Like, I mean, I, I, you're setting a foundation, you're giving them the, the principles, the foundation, the ethics, everything else that they're going to need to be successful at whatever they go into sports, business, right. anything you're, you're doing, 
Not right. that I would know. I don't have kids, but I, I've seen enough. I've coached enough kids who are good and bad. I think you're doing right. exactly what you need to. Right. So it's been a fun journey. I mean, they're they're good kids. They're, they, they make it fun. I love going out there and seeing them compete, you know. And then for my own sanity, I try not to be the crazy parent. But <laughs> <laughs> they get to see what I do, you know what I mean? Like, they see me get people better all the time. They get to see the athletes and the, and the teams that I work with, and they're just like, this is so cool, you know, that they just, they have a hand in it and they see what it takes to be successful and they get to hear those guys talk to them or those, you know, uh, women athletes talk to them and, you know, say like, Hey, what do you, what sports do you play? What do you do? Okay. Keep, mm -hmm. you know, keep going and keep fighting and, you know, make sure you do good in school and make sure you get your sleep and you eat healthy and all that stuff. So it's like they, they get to hear it from other people too. And so they get to have those sort of like, influences around them as well um, yeah that reinforcement uh, of what you're you're trying to get because, them to do right right what uh i don't want to i kind of overran my time that you allotted me what what um if someone wanted to reach out to you they want to work with you they're in southern california they're gonna be making their way there what's the best way for them and i'll have all your links to your website and you and your social media but what's the best way for them to reach out to you yeah, I mean, my email is usually best, uh, Bryce at beachfitness.com. So that's B-R-Y-C-E at beachfitness.com. Um, my facility is in Seal Beach, California, which is a block from the beach, which is nice. Um, so the business <laughs> is it? Is... You and Dan, both of <laughs> you guys, just a block from the beach. You got it made. A block from the beach, man. I know. And we're right on a nice little main street here. So it's, uh, we always say it's like Mayberry by the sea. So it's, um. <laughs> It's a nice little community, um, but yeah, I mean that's the easiest way to get a hold of me and just kind of reach out. And if you have questions, um, so a any lectures or you get teaching classes? I, come, come, anything yeah, coming so, up soon? People um, can sign up for. Uh, you know, we're trying to uh, finalize our class in Taiwan. Um, we're trying to move east with some of the education material. So uh, we're looking to go out there, especially uh, trying to plan some stuff for this next calendar year. Um, otherwise, I'll be teaching several courses here in California uh, before the year's end. Um, going to be going out and seeing Boye a couple times in the Dominican for a couple courses that he's got coming up. Very cool. Uh, that you know, I continue to learn. I, I continue to learn from him, and um, you know, try to master the methodology and the mental capacity and all the different techniques and things like that, as far as like what we do when we work with people. Um, but yeah, I mean, we're, we're, you know, as far as what we're doing here in our own facility, we're really trying to build this youth performance program, which is, you know, based in a lot of the SOMA training and LDOA practices aside mm -hmm. from actual sports training practices. So um, we're excited about that um, because that's, you know, the, the, the world of sports, youth sports here in California is got to be crazy, massive. astronomical. It's massive. It's massive. You know, we went to uh, Cooperstown this year for the first time for my son to go play baseball. And, uh, you know, there's 12 weeks that they have baseball tournaments through the summer in upper, upper, uh, up, uh, upper state New York. And, um, you know, there were 70 teams that were at the program uh, for our week. And there's 70 teams every week for 12 weeks. And uh, more than 50% of them come from California. That's amazing. Going out there playing baseball and whatnot. And uh, so it's pretty it's pretty eye-opening when you see that, especially traveling that far across the country to go do a tournament, which has become kind of popular in regards to sort of that younger generation of baseball. But um, It gets yeah. me thinking back to the old uh, – when Todd Marinovich, when he was the robo quarterback on the cover of Sports Illustrated. And I remember right. reading that. And it's like, God, that would be so cool to do. But as you said, when back in that era, it, you didn't know where to go for any of that stuff. I mean, it wasn't, right. you know, the, the voyeurs and the checks and the Poliquins and all those guys, they were out there, but there was no way to find them. If, if they, if you didn't know somebody who knew them or went to them or you know, right. maybe you read an article, but it's like, they, there was no way to go from Iowa to, to Southern California back then to do something like that, or Iowa to right. Toronto, or, you know, or France right. or anything like that. But right. now, yeah, the amount as of, you said, the amount of travel and flying I've done to learn is <laughs> <laughs> it's a line item in my uh, <laughs> in my uh, yearly expenses. So and uh, the, uh, 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 Fire Golf 2.0. When, when do you guys got that one coming out? It's coming out. Um, I believe it's in December. That first weekend in December is the okay. when we're going to be doing the 2.0. So 
we're going to be taking a look at some uh, different techniques and, and uh, how to apply those to the golfers for recovery and strength and things like that. So it's, it's going to be another really great course for, you know, people that are golfers to really learn what it is that they should be, be doing with their bodies. So we're excited cool. about I that course. F Fire Golf 1.0 is great. I highly recommend yeah. I'll put a link to that as well in the summary. Anyone wants to get on awesome. there, check that yep. out. That's that's like what, two, two days or how many hours you guys did of that? But that was really Yeah, really two cool. days, two pretty full days of uh, different exercises to try to keep the body healthy and what to do pre-golf and post-golf and things like that. So really, uh, a yeah. really good program. We I'll have some good uh, guest, guest lectures on there with uh, – um, yeah, everybody that was involved. So, cool. Well, I appreciate you coming on. I think people are really going to take a lot from this, and I highly recommend everybody follow you on social media. Check out your website. If you're in Southern California, please go check out Bryce. If you're hurting, or if you want to get better, if you want to get stronger, flexible, right, mobile, all Thank those you. wonderful things. Thank yeah. you, Bryce. I really appreciate yeah. it. Thank you, Pete. Appreciate it, man, and uh, look forward to talking to you again soon. Cool.